solidarity of the various NGOs and the various parts of government to bring about that change. And it's linked as well to the Millennium Development Goals, which are the five key goals which set out the UN and international communities work in development in any country. And the idea was to try and affect change, improve people's lives and make things better for more and more people. Georgia, we know, has come a very long way. Those people who live in Georgia have seen that journey and seen the progress. I know people who've lived here, foreigners and married to Georgia, living here with businesses and they tell you stories of what it was like 10 years ago and what it's like now and it's a completely different world. And I think that uh, the economic growth, the development, the modernization is a fantastic achievement. Maybe some of the things that haven't been done is that not everyone has benefited, benefited from it. I think there needs to be a sort of better equity or a better access to those developments so that more and more people's lives are affected positively. And I think that the Millennium Development Goals are one of those mechanisms or roadmaps that you can use to, to map out or lay out where you think you have to do your, your progress. So that's the basic, that was the, the marketing and the promo for, uh, for the UN. So I'll maybe move on to other areas, which is basically the uh, UN's work in crisis areas. Um, the UN doesn't do that work alone in any crisis area. They normally work in very close collaboration with the affected parties, with the governments, the, the various stakeholders, sometimes de facto authorities, sometimes authorities in control. And the idea is not just to break away from the politics of the crisis and deal with the causes from a humanitarian point of view, deal with the, the symptoms, to deal with what needs to be done, but through looking very, very, very much through a human-centric approach. We try not to do it, be caught up in the politics, because that's often where the challenges uh, get bogged down. And uh, in this case here in Georgia, we, we, we've worked closely with the, the government of Georgia, specifically the Ministry of the Integration, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, on the crisis. Um, the way the crisis is, uh, managed here has, has, has changed over the years uh, since I've been here. Um, before you had OSCE in South Ossetia and you had UNAMIC, the UN peacekeeping mission in Georgia. Both of those left in June 2009 and left a sort of a, a mediation negotiation vacuum. And as you know, the Geneva discussions were created under the Medyev Sarkozy plan. And that was to create an international platform for all the parties to come together and discuss what it is that needs to be fixed politically. And uh, it's made up of um, the three consistent parts, or constituent parts are the, the UN, the EU, and the OSCE. And they have two working groups. One working group one looks at the security, political, and status issue. Working group two looks at humanitarian and the, the, the needs of vulnerable populations such as the IDPs, returnees, and refugees. And those are the two for us. Working Group 1 is very much on the political front, very much looking at the co-chairs and mediation efforts for and with the parties. The Working Group 2 is very much about the people, very much the affected populations on both sides of the ABL, how they've been affected by the crisis, how the conflict has affected them, and how we have to address those needs and better prepare them for return, uh, integration, whatever the case may be, whatever the choices may be. And uh, I think that the work that's going on um, in the, the, the conflict areas or the post-conflict areas is quite interesting because uh, we see changes. These things are never constant. Uh, what's happening with the change in leadership in, in Abkhazia, for example, we saw a change from when Bagapch was there to when Agbab was there. Things have changed in terms of the perception of how they see the crisis, how they see the role of the international community and how they see the solution as a solution and what they want as a solution. We've seen now that uh, in the Geneva discussions there's been a, 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 a suggestion that we change the format because how it works doesn't suit the Abkhaz. They want a different type of mediation platform, negotiation platform. Uh, I don't know what, what the outcome of that will be. Meanwhile, there's been a change of government down here. We don't know what that brings about. We've heard some things been mentioned about possible changes, but I think until things settle, we're not quite certain. South Ossetia, there was a change in leadership there at the end of last year into this year. Again, we don't know what the outcome of that will be. Meanwhile, there's been a change in the leadership in Russia over the last 18 months with the return of Putin. So the thing is never constant enough for you to be able to predict where you think it is and where you think you need to go. But what is consistent and what is real is the fact that people's lives need to be helped.
People cannot be caught frozen in a conflict or a post-conflict situation. Life is not like that. You can't hang on to a humanitarian situation when the crisis is over. You want to move on. You want to have a life. You want to have a future. Regardless of the politics, you want that to move on. And sometimes that's not always easy because the political forces often restrict those developments. And so we insist from a humanitarian point of view, we respect and adhere to the humanitarian principles which are set out in the ICRC and NGO Code of Conduct, which says quite clearly that we work in independent, impartial and neutral. We work there for the people of whatever crisis we work in, in this case, Abkhazia, Georgia, South Ossetia. We work with those people to bring about some degree of stability, to bring about some degree of confidence, to bring about some degree of conflict resolution and possible conflict transformation. And that's done through a number of different ways. Um, the law on occupied territory in Georgia um, sees the situation from a very legalistic point of view. There was a, a strategy on the, the occupied territories there's an action plan in the occupied territories and there's modalities for working in the occupied territories. These are very much the framework, the legal and operational framework which we as the international community have to work through as well. So as well as being guided by humanitarian principles which are universal and accepted, we have to then also deal with the legal frameworks and the, the national law frameworks of, of any country. It's very difficult in this situation because you have challenges to authority, challenges to, to, to control, challenges to access. And uh, despite the attempts to try and keep those doors of humanitarian access as being paramount and the humanitarian imperative being the most important part of the work we do, the political forces are much stronger than we are. And so it's our constant battle to separate politics from human and deal with human first and politics eventually, hopefully, will compromise itself into a situation where everybody will agree. We have, I think, as uh, UNDP, played an important role in conflict prevention and conflict transformation in supporting, I think, international and local peacekeeping efforts. And we've done this through a number of different avenues, different vectors, mostly about confidence building. And so over the last years, working in Abkhazia, the UN has tried to connect people across the divide, connect people that are disconnected or broken or split by conflict and war, as we do in any other situation. We have, a, inside the UNDP office, a crisis and prevention recovery unit, which looks at the situational changes on the ground, looks at ways of supporting local actors, looks at the way of supporting civil society, looks at the way of, of dealing with affected communities, and try to mobilize those communities to take care of themselves, to be much more, much more stronger, much more able to resist the challenges that come their way, to resist the interference and to make progress where they can. That works on both sides, Alex, works be it on Abkhazia's side, be it San Magrello. We have different projects making those things happen. We have, a, as UNDP, we have a, a, an important global role, I think, in peace building and especially in fragile and post-conflict settings. And for us, we think that you cannot do post-conflict uh, resolution without dealing with development. People have to have a future and you can only have a future through development, not through humanitarian. So whenever the opportunity arises, we have to move swiftly from giving people food, for example, to giving people seeds to grow food, to becoming much more sustainable for themselves, from their families and from their communities, because the international aid can stop. As we've seen in many crisis situations, people become dependent on aid. And I think it's important and I think it's responsible that we, the international community, recognize when that cutoff point should be. Before you flip into dependency, you are able to become more sustainable, more self-reliant, and more able to take care of yourself your family and your communities devolved of the political situation you find yourself in. We have a, a project you may have heard of, it's called Coburn, which is a confidence building early response mechanism. It's an EU funded project, 4 million, lari, 4 million euros, which we use in South Ossetia, in Abkhazia, in Georgia, dealing with affected populations, dealing with people to people contact dealing with human-centric approaches to 
building people's livelihoods and lives back again. And including building people's livelihoods, it means connecting back with communities. Where communities were broken after the war in 2008 or earlier, we tried to develop kind of connections between sports, cultural, trade, teachers, medical, bring those people together which are needed for survival, needed for development, but not needed for politics. But again, it's very, very difficult because you have much in the way of political interference. And uh, the crisis in Georgia has been very politically charged from many different sides, many different forces. And it's been very, very hard to keep it neutral. As is any crisis situation, you can't keep it neutral because in a crisis there's always loss. Loss of life, loss of property, loss of land, loss of autonomy, whatever it may be, there's always loss. So it's very difficult to deal with that without it being political. But from a human point of view, you have to deal with loss. You have to replace it, you have to fix it, you have to repair it, or you have to live with it. And these things are often very hard and often take a long time. You only have to look at the crisis in many parts of the world, be it Nagorno-Karabakh, be it from Transnistria, Moldova, be it in Cyprus, be it in places I worked before, the crisis can last a generation, 25 years, the post-conflict situation before you get some degree of recognized healing. And there has to be processes of reconciliation, process of confidence building across the divide between the communities, inter-intra communities, intra-inter generations, for that, to, for that peace to be sustainable. Because if you don't remove the fragility and the precariousness of what causes the crisis, then it can always come back. Because in any situation, not everyone gets what they want. And not everyone gets what they need. And sometimes people try to take it. And don't always take it by legitimate means. I've been in places in West Africa, where that's either done through military being discontented and causing a coup. I've seen it done in places in Cote d'Ivoire, where the youth rise up and take up arms and become gangsters and street violence pursuers, then it becomes a political crisis. It can happen in many different ways. You saw the Arab Spring last year, which affected change in many parts of the world, sometimes good, sometimes bad. You look back now at what's happening in Egypt, one would think it was a solution to the problems, and now we have a whole different round of crisis. So unless you take away or you address properly the roots of those crises, it's very hard for you to prevent conflict from re-emerging. Maybe not immediately, but 10 years, 15 years, another round would spark it off again. So the mechanism we have, Coburn, is a people, community-based, non-governmental, it's not, it doesn't work with the government, it works with civil society, think tanks, academics, doctors, nurses, geographers, historians, journalists, sportsmen, cultural dancers, <coughs> youth movement, it's about that, traders, to try and get them to connect to each other and understand the, the human dimension of the crisis different from the political dimension of the crisis. Because if you don't do that, you can't. You might not change the crisis, but you can change people who suffer from the crisis, who suffer because of the crisis, and that's an important dynamic, it's an important dimension. Otherwise, you spend your whole time peacekeeping. You spend your whole time taking steps to try and transform, transform politically the conversation and the confrontation and the conflict, and that's not easy. Um, we are launching a new phase of Coburn and we hope to try and encourage. And it's very much in line with the action plan of, uh, of the Georgian action plan on occupied territories, which looks at this connectivity to people, different ways of doing it through health, education, various other mechanisms. And Coburn is like any other tried and tested method. This is not a new concept, it's things we use in other parts of the world. And sometimes they're more successful than others. Sometimes when a, cr when a crisis is just newly finished and people still remember it, it's often harder to bring about change. But sometimes it's actually easier to bring about change and it depends on, on the situation you find yourself in. We, um, we here in, in Georgia, we have um, a number of mechanisms whereby, I, I mentioned Geneva to you, Geneva is the international platform where people come together, the parties, um, Russia, Georgia, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, are in the room with the US, the EU, the UN, and they have to discuss, the OSCE, to discuss what's happening and how the international efforts can support 
the parties to come to some agreement on status issues, on non-use of force, on retaliatory issues, on you know uh, land misappropriation, whatever it may be, human rights issues. And it's important you have that. But it's also important that you have mechanisms here on the ground. And from a humanitarian point of view, we have basically three major mechanisms. One is with the operational agencies and organisations working in Abkhazia, NGOs, Red Cross, and the UN. The other one includes the, the international donors, international ambassadors, who work in support of the work we do. And then we have another group which is called the Ambassadorial Working Group, which is only ambassadors discussing political and other challenges that face a country like Georgia. And how can we help? How can we support? What is it needs to be done? What advice? What advocacy? What campaigning can we do? And those mechanisms are consultation mechanisms. We don't just speak to ourselves. We bring in people. We bring in, during the elections, for example, we brought in the parties to discuss with them their agendas, their priorities, their future hopes, and how we could be part of that discussion and consultation. And I think it's important that the international community, be it the UN or the, the, the donors, we are seen to be a support to the efforts of the Georgian people and the Georgian government. And that is not something we don't lead. We stay behind and support what's going ahead. Um, and also, we are one of the co-chairs in Geneva as the UN. So we have, a, a, along with the EU and the OSCE, we have a responsibility at the highest level to ensure the parties keep connected, keep committed, and think of some sort of degree of compromise, some view towards getting compromise and getting a solution to this, because the solution sometimes can't be found by negotiation between parties. Sometimes there has to be a catalytic mediation effort, and that's normally done by the international community, in this case, the EU, US, uh, so UN and the OSCE. Um, I'll maybe just finish up a little bit now on uh, on just on the human rights situation and some of the, the other things that we see in Georgia, then I'll maybe open up for some comments and some questions if that's okay. Um, I think that Georgia's gone through quite a challenging period in its development or it's in its life. And I think uh, there's been really impressive successes that have been recognized throughout the years in the democratic domain in Georgia. Um, I think the, the democratic transformation, however, has been tested by the economic and political realities on the ground. And I think that uh, we want to make sure that the, the institutions, the, the government, keeps pace with these reforms by continuing to support the strengthening and development of the, the institutions of the state, which are responsible for carrying out governance and government, rule of law, etc. And uh, we also think that the civil society in Georgia needs to be differently strengthened and differently supported. It should be across the country, not just in Tbilisi. It should be at different levels, different entry points. And it should be much more widely open to outside. I think that we are looking for a number of target areas as the UN in terms of trying to consolidate the democracy in Georgia. And these are a balance of power between the executive, the legislative and judiciary branches of government to, as we've seen in the recent elections in October, free and fair elections. These are things that we've been pushing in a principal way for a long time. Effective local self-government rather than centralised government, spread the democracy to other areas and therefore bring about democratic and economic reform of these areas. Fundamental reform of the judiciary and bring about and create the support, the development of a professional and independent media. These are all things that you've heard in the last months. Very, very clearly resonate very positively with the election promises, the election discussions, the agenda that was out there all those months ago. Um, and I think that these are the areas where the, the international community, the UN, will continue to support Georgia and its development of these institutions because we believe that civil society, media, the state, the different elements of the state have to be as fully developed and strong and independent as possible for that to work as a, a real democracy, a sustainable democracy. And maybe just say, I'll, I'll, I'll close there and say that uh, I'm happy to take questions or comments. Thank you, questions? Thank you very much for visiting us. My name is Nia. I work here as a teacher of English language at the moment. 
uh, worked at the UNAMI in 2006-2009. I remember very much through the direct line with Suhumi that uh, there was kind of sorrow and from my side it was I was happy because Russians would not be peacekeepers anymore. But from the Abkhazian side I felt that they lost the very last hope of keeping maybe identification, I identity, Abkhazian identity there. I don't know if through the UNDP problems anything is going on. So it's not only life or hunger or whatever health, but this identity is important as well. Another question, you know that since the new government is on, there are some new groups coming to town that the application museum should be closed. Among them is the Deputy Minister of Urban Culture. So what should be closed? Occupation Museum. Oh, yes, it's a yeah. So uh, there's another group who's whatever defending the museum should be on stage. So what's your opinion? Thank you very much. Okay, Neil, thanks. Uh, I hope my English isn't as bad as it sounds to me um, from an English teacher's point of view. Um, no, I, I, from a Unimig point of view, therefore, you know um, the challenges. It wasn't an easy ride for Unimig either. I mean, it wasn't easy while they were there as the UN. It didn't mean they weren't faced with serious impediments and were pushed around or weren't being tripped up or impeded because of um, political forces there. But on your question of identity, I think that's what our Coburn project is about. It's about allowing people to breathe, to articulate, to express their, their, their own desires. Um, not given to them by political forces, not given to them by uh, you know a line that's coming from a certain place. You know, there's a in, in Abkhazia, they have a, a, a security issue, a, a, an insecurity issue about themselves. I think the you know the, the, the ethnic balance in Abkhazia is probably it changes all the time. I think it's changing. I think now you probably find there's a larger growing number of, of Russians who who are there. And I think those things, as well as the presence of having Russian forces and Russian bases, the perception of how you look to the outside world uh, has changed, or is changing. And uh, I think that uh, some Abkhaz people probably have a, a, a concern about their identity being lost. And I think, you know, I, I think there's no way of getting away from that. Um, the, the, the people are there, the Russians are there, they're doing work there, they're supporting whatever you want to call it. At the end of the day, uh, at some point in time, when when does it become more of what you want or less of what you want in terms of you know how, how do you make it Europe Casio? Because there are many forces which would prevent it from being that, and I think that you would know from the Unimig days there are many people who are there who are the civil society is not strong there, and it's something we've been trying hard to walk through our various projects to try and develop that to make sure that uh, these issues are kept kept alive. But on, on the Occupation Museum, I think I visited it uh, before it reopened. It was closed for a while, I don't think I opened it, I went back there. I, I mean, to me, it's part of it's part of your history, um, but I don't know, but it depends how, how you pitch history. You know, you can tell history in many different ways. You don't have to tell it the right way. You can tell it your way. And I think it's important that um, that conversation is taking place. That, and that's, a, I think it's a mark of democracy when you've got two opposing groups you know, this, uh, asking for changes and people having discussions around those issues. But it's not for me, I, I don't have any, personally I don't have any uh, And preference. you mentioned some compromises to be made. Uh, I'm afraid that some people will consider it as a compromise to close this occupation museum, so. Yeah, but I think that, you know, if you're going to affect change in a conflict, the compromise is needed. But, whether, but I think you have to compromise on the right things. I think the important thing is not to get lost on um, detail or get diverted from detail. And I think you should need to prioritize those things which have to be addressed and I'm not sure. That's what I wanted to do. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Some other questions? Hello, uh, my name is Andrew I have a question about uh, how well people are informed on the ground in Abkhazia and or some travel south of Latvia about the problem the current developments in Politics or the social life of the overall the rest part of the country. I had a friend who came uh, from Abkhazia to, to study in DC and he was telling me that they put on air a 
still they put on their war scenes so that it remains fresh in people's memory. I was wondering if you were informed about what is the, the level of information um, that they get uh, about uh, the developments in the rest of the country. And I was wondering about the development of internet, um, in, in, in especially in Abkhazia. Uh, how, how, how good is the internet connection, whether or not there may be opportunities for, uh, I guess, people from the rest of the country to actually communicate with some people that they left in Abkhazia and still want to communicate with them, and that whether they may, may be people to people communication and to, in a way, create the islands of integrity that you may think about evolving in the future. Thank you. Okay, thanks. A good question. Um, as in any situation where you have a crisis or a conflict or post-conflict, um, propaganda is important. <coughs> propaganda is a very important tool, mechanism, weapon, whatever you want to call it, for getting across a message, your message, to counter another message. Um, I personally don't watch television, so I, I can't tell you whether I ever saw anything up I only watch television for football. Any other reason I get it off the internet. Um, on the question of the internet, that is a very important tool and it's becoming much more widespread in Abkhazia, thankfully. And as you see in Georgia also, this is a very internet savvy country and it's becoming that way in Abkhazia. And I think it's a very positive opportunity for the connectivity we have to create. Um, I know that um, staff that we have in Sohomi uh, talk to other staff in Gali on issues using the internet. The internet, however, is not that good in other places outside the urban areas. Uh, we, as the UN, uh, with support from USAID, have been trying to, and we are in the process of expanding the network. And we're trying to use that there to then start doing some online training for youth in terms of uh, English language, in terms of um, the use of the internet, the use of um, media. Uh, and we're trying to do that in such a way that they are better prepared for opportunities, they can learn more, they can get exposure to beyond their own horizons into new areas. And I think uh, it's something that we all recognise. And I think it's also, I'm sure there are many people here in Georgia who are connected to people in Abkhazia. Whether it's allowed or not, I'm sure there's Facebook and there's other ways of doing it. I'm sure there are messages passed and forth. I know there are people who go on we create events whereby we take people from South Ossetia and Abkhazia and Georgia, we take youth, we take them to Turkey, we take them to other parts of the world. They make connections in a third country. They then go back and stay in connection. And I'm sure that's how these networks develop. The Coburn project we have coming up uh, at the end of this month is exactly geared for that purpose, to create projects which will allow people to, to have conversations face to face and then keep those conversations going electronically or virtually as time passes by. And if you make enough connections, I think, between youth or business people or doctors or journalists or teachers or cultural or sportsmen, those are the, the, the connections that all of a sudden over the years build closer and closer ties. And if nothing disrupts those ties, they get stronger. And I think that's something that we hope will be the case. Is it announced already, this Cuban? Oh yeah, that's going out. We'll be, we'll be on our website probably in about two weeks, and it's we we've been encouraging um, our partners who used it before. It was a very successful, and it was regarded as a very successful tool to bring people connected. And we believe the next time round, hopefully, we'll profit from the changes that have taken place or will take place. We hope and help not only improve people's lives, but will improve people's understanding or to clear up the misunderstandings and the propaganda that's sometimes there and trying to effect a positive change for as many people as possible. Thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, you have been observing the situation in Abkhazia and uh, South Ossetia, the Sinwar region, for a couple of years. So what are the main developments you have noticed or experienced or can can tell us so it could be economic social or political um, i've never gone into south ossetia because it's not possible 
but I, I, in Geneva discussions, I meet with the South Ossetians who attend there as part of the people who represent South Ossetia. Um, the changes have been change in personnel in terms of people who come to Geneva, people who are in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, they're different from when I first came. Uh, for example, Shamba's gone up, Bagapsha's gone, been replaced by Chiribba and Dangvab. That in itself is a change. Um, how that change materializes itself, it's very hard to understand it as one, one change, when there are other changes taking place as well. When you see the roads being completely redeveloped, you see cultural centers being built, you see hospitals being built, schools being built, you see the presence of Russian GRUs, you see a, a more fixed border. Those are physical changes you see. What impact that has on, on, on people it's hard to say, but I would imagine it's probably very mixed. Some people would be okay with it because it maybe helps them. Some people would be less okay. You mentioned the identity issue because it maybe affects their perception of how they see things. And I think with the Sochi Olympics coming up, things will move more rapidly in a, in a certain way that changes things again. I, I think that uh, the, the IPRM being closed off in Abkhazia is a significant development. I think uh, the call for change of format in Geneva is these are significant developments. I think that what they are are the, the Abkhaz sending messages out that we want change, we want something different. What we've been getting to know is not what we want. I don't think they're just giving that to us. I think it's giving it to Georgians and to Russians and others. I think they want something else. And I, I haven't had an articulation of what that something else is. And I think now with the change, changes here in Tbilisi, they might wait for those to settle down before they actually articulate them. Or they might wait to see what comes from here before they respond. But certainly the, the changes have been in terms of political personalities, which then affects the civil society and the actual structure and the physical infrastructure of Abkhazia has changed since I've been there. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Tamuna Kovlitz. I have a question regarding the Geneva process in which you have been participating for some time already. So, how do you think um, the appointment of the special representative for the relations with Russia will have an impact, if at all, on the Geneva talks and what do you think are the perspectives there? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I think it was always mentioned that there was going to be some sort of envoy. Um, I think that's been mentioned for a while. Um, I think it remains to be seen with all the changes that have taken place in the Georgian delegation. You know, Sergei Kabanadze is gone, Arakli Porchidze is gone, has been replaced by the new deputy, by Shakidze, by uh, uh, Keti from uh, SMR. I think that, they'll have to see how that affects the change. Whether whether the, the new special envoy, Zura Abashizi, will actually be connected to Geneva, I'm not sure. I'm sure he'll be coming possibly to do the margins with Geneva to get access to some of the key figures from Russia, in particular Deputy Foreign Minister Karasin. But I haven't heard it explained to me yet. Um, certainly he'll have a, a, a role and a function in Moscow. And whether how that triangulates with Geneva and Tbilisi, I'm not sure. Um, it wasn't quite clear to me how all that was all meant to, to work out. It strikes me as being quite an explorative approach to things. Um, and I know that the Geneva co-chairs were meeting with uh, Mr. Abishidze to try and see how that's fixed. And I think they met, met on a meeting with Mr. Abishidze, the Deputy uh, Foreign Minister, to find out how all these things piece together. Um, and clearly, the previous government, in particular people like Sergei Kapanadze and people like uh, Deputy Foreign Minister and Gigi Bukeria, current National Security Council, I think they have given strong and straight and serious advice to the new incomers who will be attending Geneva to set them on a track because the role of what Georgia wants from the Geneva discussions must be the same as they've always wanted. It must be the solution, progress, positive developments, and how you get that is different. And with new people coming to the talks, 
things won't happen quickly because they'll have to understand the dynamics. Geneva is a very, <coughs> I would describe as a very Kafkaesque situation where people are in a, in a very weird world. It's a, it's a world apart, but it's part of the world, if you know what I mean. And so it's actually, you have to go in there and become something you're not normally outside. And then to use your skills inside and, and affect the changes for the outside. It's quite, quite amazing. And I, I think it, it's so difficult to, to make changes easily that um, having a special or an envoy for Russia the impact on Geneva won't be clear for some time, if, if at all. But I, I would, I would leave the jury out on that one and hope that um, better connectivity and less resistance and more openness would be a result of these changes. Thank you. I'm Dr. Gafnizetti from Kanafi University. Um, I have two questions, actually. One question is about the degree of the sovereignty of uh, the administrations, current administrations of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Uh, so for 15 years we used to live in reality when the Russia was peacekeeper and uh, the conflict parties were Georgia and Abkhazia, Georgia and South Ossetia. In 2008 this has been changed and now the parties are Russia and Georgia and uh, uh, current government, when they were in opposition, they were openly make statements that we need to declare that the parties are Abkhazia and South Ossetia. So we, we should uh, negotiate uh, them directly. That was the point, and uh, I'm interested in what, what you think about it. And uh, what is the degree of sovereignty of these two? Do they make any decisions uh, independently without without Russian interference. But I remember in 2008 that a uh, Minister of Defense, Minister of Internal Affairs, and if I'm mistaken, the Prosecutor General, where the ethnic Russians, uh, so not the Serbians, but ethnic Russian FSB uh, generals, so they were uh, controlling this uh, territory. Uh, and the second question is, uh, what do you think in the future, how how can the this um, conflict be resolved? So, what is the plan A, plan B, plan C? So, what uh, if, if we will imagine that uh, uh, so these people who were victims of ethnic cleaning left their homes and their houses were burned? Uh, how we can resolve? when the uh, international society is saying that uh, we recognize territorial integrity, sovereignty of uh, Georgia, with this internationally recognized borders. So in uh, this talk, how this conflict can be resolved? I'm, I'm saying like in five years or 10 years or 20 years. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, I mean, on the question of sovereignty, I, mean, I, I think it's, it's hard to call. I, mean, I, I know from my discussions up there, we are told very straight things by Abkhaz, by Chirikba. I'm not sure whether it's him saying them or whether it's someone else, but uh, he's the one that tells us, um, we no longer want you to work in these areas. We don't want you to do this. So uh, I, yeah, I can only take it for what, it, for what it's like. It's not for me to question. Um, and I don't think it puts you in a strong position to, to negotiate if you are straight away seeing your interlocutor as someone who you think he isn't, so I, I, I don't think that's... Well, but on the issue of, of uh, you know, discussions, I think that we shouldn't rule out bilateral and trilateral discussions. I think that as long as you have the international platform, which is Geneva, and that's where the work is, is completed, whatever you can do to enrich that, be it a special representative for, uh, for Russia, or be it um, bilateral discussions, informal, formal proximity talks, one track one and a half, track two, whatever your negotiation, you have to use all the variables. Otherwise it becomes stale. And I think Geneva, from what people tell, what they say, and what the reaction is, people are unhappy with Geneva. It's not bringing about results that they want. And I think that uh, there has to be a, rec a recognition that you have to use injections to that. And an injection could be a change of personalities, <coughs> could be a change of approach, could be an additional discussion, an additional negotiation process. 
And it could be a change in attitude as well. I mean, all of those things can affect the, the changes that you might want to bring about. Um, and it's probably linked to your second question about uh, when does it get resolved, plan A, plan B. <coughs> plan A, I would say, was hope, and plan B, I'd say, was hope. Um, and I would say that uh, you hope that people stay engaged, you hope the discussions keep going, you hope the access continues, you hope the attitude's positive, you hope people's lives can be helped, and you hope the politics doesn't interfere with what you're trying to do. And, but then I think that we have to recognise that unfolding a crisis, as, as I mentioned earlier, wherever it may be, doesn't happen early. It sometimes takes a generation. And I would say that you must consider, it's okay to get quick wins, but they've got to be sustainable wins. And what you're looking for is a solution that works for as many people as possible and, and takes away the possibilities of a re-emerging crisis by the work you do. It's hard work. It's tough work, and you've got to admire some of these people who stay with these processes for decades. At the end of the day, you get something which is right. how it looks in 20 years. I mean, you might be sitting in government, so you may want to think that yourself. You might want to be the minister of MFA or integration, whatever we call then. You might want to think, how would you fix it? So how would you think you would do it if you had the chance right now? This is your magic wand, and you can wave it. What would you do? Actually, Coburn is a big hope as well. Sorry? The, the problem you said, Coburn program, will be a big hope. Yeah, well. I mean, I, if you can get people talking, and the, the, the colleague beside you talked about internet, if you can get people to explore the future rather than explore the past, to get away from what caused the problem to getting forward to where the solution might be, there's a political dynamic, there's a political dimension which we sit in this room can't do anything about. But there's a people dimension that we can because we're people. And we have to make that happen. And then let the political wheels turn the way they turn. Or not turn the way they don't turn. But that doesn't mean that we cannot be human. We cannot, we cannot stop us being people to people to be a sort of human-centric approach to these things. And it's only then you bring about change. Sometimes it takes the church in some crisis. I've been in Mozambique, for example. It was a Catholic church that created the, the opportunity for the crisis to stop. So there are many different elements. It doesn't have to be political that brings about change. It can be civil society. It can be youth, Arab Spring. It can be people there who say, enough. I want to try something. I want a chance to make the connections. I want a chance for my voice to be heard. I want me to be listened to. My voice counts. And that's something we have to encourage. And that's what Coburn is about. It's about creating. It's about all the work we do there, peace building, conflict transformation, human security development is what we call it. And that's what we, we have to try and encourage and strengthen and expand. Otherwise, I, I have my doubts that I'll, I'll be sitting here in many years to come doing the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank you uh, okay. I'd like to thank the guests, students, uh, uh, professors. Uh, I'd like to make an announcement for the next uh, public lecture. It will be held on December 4th at 2 p.m. Our guest will be Ambassador of the United States of America, His Excellency of uh, Mr. Richard Norland, and the topic will be U.S.-Georgian relations in the light of the elections. So it will be quite interesting selection as well as it was uh, today's one. I'd like to thank you everyone for coming, for asking uh, interesting questions, and especially our distinguished guest, Mr. Jamie Goldmark-Coldrick. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.